Were you ever introduced to a pyramid during biology class that depicted animals at different levels? Usually carnivores at the top and plants at the bottom? That is known as a trophic pyramid, and believe it or not, it has been the topic of some controversy in the world of marine science. Let's talk about it. You can think of a trophic pyramid as a representation of the biomass within an ecosystem. Usually, for terrestrial ecosystems, you would see the base of the pyramid represented by some form of vegetation. Those are your primary producers, organisms usually thought of as autotrophs, being able to produce their energy from inorganic matter, like sunlight. The following level would be that of primary consumers, which will usually be your herbivores, organisms that feed on primary producers. Species like these rely on the existence of autotrophs to get their energy, since they are unable to carry out processes like photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. Further up there are secondary consumers, predators that will feed on primary consumers. And then at the top you will find tertiary or quaternary consumers, large predators that can feed on everything underneath them. Most consumers are not capable of acquiring energy without consuming organic matter, making them heterotrophs. As energy flows through the food web, it gets turned into biomass, the quantity or weight of organism in a given environment. The pyramid is the shape used to summarize the abundance of biomass, usually with size or trophic level. For instance, in a forest environment, you may have the surrounding vegetation as your primary producers. Herbivores like rabbits will be your primary consumers, snakes and other small predators will be secondary consumers, and then a large raptor species will be the tertiary consumer. Every time energy is transferred from one trophic level to another, some of it is lost in the process. And the ensuing effect is that higher trophic levels will have smaller biomasses than lower trophic levels. And that is evident when you do a visual survey in a forest as trees are abundant, rabbits and other small herbivores are a little bit rarer, and then hawks and other top predators are the most elusive species. But when looking at marine environments, does this model actually hold any water? Pun intended. At the beginning of the century, several researchers noticed high shark abundances during underwater visual censuses in remote Pacific islands. These were carried out by scientific divers counting fish underwater to estimate their biomass. Those resulted in top predators comprising the largest fraction of total fish biomass, up to 85% in Kingman Atoll. Soon after though, other researchers started pointing out that those numbers may not be accurate, as the underwater visual censuses were likely overestimating the presence of large predators like sharks. If you're counting fish during an underwater survey, the trickiest ones to accurately count are the most mobile ones, since they are constantly coming in and out of your field of view. This makes it very difficult to count how many sharks are in a large group, or shiver. Mark recapture studies, which estimate abundance by tagging and recapturing sharks over time, found top predator abundance to be lower than previously determined. In the case of grey reef sharks at the Palmyra Atoll, about 21 sharks per square kilometer were estimated using mark recapture methods, compared to the 200 to 1000 sharks per square kilometer that were implied by previous studies. But still, top predators comprise just under half of the census's biomass, which is unusually high and doesn't really fit the pyramid shape discussed earlier. These studies led to the idea that coral reefs and potentially all marine ecosystems have inverted trophic pyramids under pristine conditions. The explanation offered by one of those early studies was that turnover rates are lower in large marine predators like sharks and way faster in phytoplankton and other lower trophic levels, allowing biomass to accumulate at the very top of the pyramid. This was a very interesting new concept when I was in college and it made a lot of us genuinely interested in marine trophic ecology and how it differs from terrestrial counterparts. However, it turns out that the explanation offered by some of those early studies was really just an observation. When looking at a snapshot of a marine environment, we see a picture frozen in time, and the biomass of large sharks is always going to look greater than that of phytoplankton. However, 
if you consider the annual production cycle of phytoplankton, corals, and algae, their biomass is way greater than that of sharks. Sharks are not necessarily accumulating more biomass than lower trophic levels, they're simply much more visible because each individual shark represents a greater amount of biomass. The English zoologist Charles Elton originally conceived the idea of a size-based pyramid, where abundance would vary with an organism's size. A graduate student from the University of Minnesota, Raymond Lindman, then took that concept and simplified it, getting rid of size altogether and instead focusing on categorical trophic level, or the roles that organisms have in their ecosystem. This has been how most textbooks have depicted trophic pyramids, while also forgetting that Elton's view was that size was the ultimate causality for abundance and in turn biomass in production, rather than categorical trophic level. But Elton's size-based model seems more useful when estimating the abundance of an organism within its ecosystem. For instance, a blue whale feeds on krill and falls prey itself to killer whales, which would in turn have a higher categorical trophic level. But blue whales are larger and less abundant than killer whales, and they would fit very nicely in a size-based pyramid. So, to convert the Lindman pyramid into a more useful Eltonian one, scientists investigated the relationship between trophic level and body size. And as it turns out, size spectra seem to be the underlying mathematical basis for ecological pyramids. Let's look at a graph depicting a size-based pyramid, where different mass categories are stacked on top of each other, and their size is represented by the abundance. Don't worry, there's not going to be too much math, I promise. The body mass, or M, will increase as abundance, or N, will decrease with each mass category. If we take this pyramid depicting abundance at different body masses, we can align those numbers with the y-axis, rotate the axes 90 degrees so that the mass is on the x-axis and the abundance on the y-axis, and then flip it so your y-axis is on the left. You can notice abundance decreases almost exponentially as mass increases. By applying a logarithmic scale, this curve can be converted to a linear slope. This linear relationship is known as size spectrum. Size spectra have intrigued aquatic ecologists for many decades, and are increasingly being used to model both marine and some terrestrial ecosystems. Yet, Concepts like trophic pyramids or even food webs seem to be missing the mark, focusing on species-specific processes rather than size-based ones. These concepts don't illustrate well the significance of something like a diet shift in an organism's life. For instance, white sharks in the western Atlantic Ocean begin their life feeding on bony fish as small as the northern sandlands but then consume increasingly large prey as they increase in size, including large bony fish like bluefish, small sharks like spiny dogfish, eventually large pelagic species like Atlantic bluefin tuna, and finally marine mammals like gray seals, with smaller bony fish eventually becoming less relevant. These are ontogenetic diet shifts, or changes in diet through the lifetime of an organism, and they are not really represented in a species-centric trophic pyramid or even in a food web because the species position varies over time. And this is only one example of ecological processes that are not really well explained by these trophic pyramids. Size spectra are simply the abundance of organisms at a given size class. These are most often estimated using trawl surveys, but can also be calculated using underwater visual synthesis. But large species like sharks are particularly difficult to obtain density estimates using both methods, mainly due to the difficulty to either catch or detect them. Baited remote underwater videos, or BRUVs, are increasing in popularity as a means to attract and record the presence of species at an underwater location, using bait to attract fauna to a small, waterproof camera like a GoPro. And although this method can provide relative abundance of large species, it is not clear how to convert those values into usable density estimates, at least for now. But a size spectrum allows us to get the estimate of relative numbers at any given size class. However, we also need a mean trophic level for any given size. This is often done through stable nitrogen isotope analysis, which requires small tissue samples from each species within each size class. 
The amount of nitrogen-15 isotopes will increase with higher trophic levels, and thus can be measured to estimate the mean trophic level of an organism. As we return to our graph, two parameters can then be calculated using this information. The predator-prey mass ratio, or PPMR, which is a relationship between mean nitrogen-15 isotope levels and the mass or size class, and the transfer efficiency, or TE, which is a relationship between the predator production divided by the prey production, and is usually 5 to 15 percent. PPMR estimates across four different ecosystems concluded that predators are usually between 100 and 10,000 times heavier than their prey. And all these parameters eventually produce the following scary looking equation which can be used to map the shape and size of trophic pyramids. I promise you don't need to know how to use this thing to understand trophic pyramids. In the ocean's smallest organisms like zooplankton, PPMR is low and T is high, about 15%. In larger size classes at higher trophic levels, PPMR tends to be greater and T is low, about 5%. All this information was then used to create this figure. The bell curves on the side represent the probability of the coordinates for PPMR and T on the graph, with the greatest probability represented by this black cross. The blue areas correspond to the coordinates of classic pyramids, while the red ones correspond to those of inverted pyramids. The plausible space for an inverted trophic pyramid on this graph would lie above the solid yellow line. but. As you can see, that is way off the realm of plausible coordinates for either TE or PPMR. In conclusion, considering what we know about how PPMR and TE constrain energy flow through communities, and if the sharks sampled at those remote Pacific islands are size-based predators that are not operating with a significantly higher trophic transfer efficiency than what is currently considered feasible, then Inverted trophic pyramids are simply energetically impossible. So why did it seem like there was such high shark biomass in those remote and relatively unexploited ecosystems? Scientists have hypothesized that these are aggregations of individuals that have skimmed energy off the top of many nearby trophic pyramids. And this is consistent with the behavior of large migratory species like sharks. They can accumulate biomass by foraging at multiple places at different times, taking advantage of a variety of energy sources that often go beyond the scope of most surveys. For instance, tiger sharks in Australia are known to prey on sea turtles, but are not specialized to target those prey items only. Instead, tiger sharks take advantage of seasonal nesting aggregations of green turtles, where there is much more biomass available for less effort. But after those, tiger sharks will switch to other, more plentiful food sources to satisfy their needs. If this hypothesis is indeed true, it really speaks to the success of large migratory predators like sharks, which would have found a way to transcend the energy limitations of a single ecosystem, to the point of making certain scientists question the shape of trophic pyramids. Phew! So there you go. That's the full story behind trophic pyramids, and the controversies that arose from the idea of inverted pyramids, which really don't seem to be a thing and are more of an illusion created both by sampling limitations and potentially the behavior of marine top predators. There were a lot of technicalities that I skipped over to keep this relatively brief, as size-based insights of marine ecosystems are continuously being refined through new methodologies and models. So, don't be surprised if this information changes in a few years. But hopefully, now you'll know exactly what those trophic pyramids found on textbooks are both trying to represent and what they're failing to fully illustrate. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any feedback or questions about the shape of trophic pyramids, or if you have any requests or suggestions about what the next video should be about, feel free to leave a comment. Finally, if you want to learn more about fun facts on individual species that we share our land and sea with, you can follow me on Instagram at VictorCEDAL. As you can see, I don't post very regularly, but I am trying to change that. I have switched jobs and moved a few times over the last year, and now that things have more or less stabilized, I am trying to produce more content. I can't guarantee any regularity yet, but it should be more frequent than it has been so far. So stay tuned.